Hi, my name is Kanika Aquinas and you're watching the video Fourth Cranial Nerve Palsy Characteristics of an Acquired Unilateral Palsy. In this video, we'll be discussing just that, the characteristics of an acquired unilateral palsy and specifically in relation to a recently acquired palsy. So when we see a patient with a fourth nerve palsy, it is necessary to establish whether the condition is congenital or acquired and whether it is unilateral or bilateral. And so what you can see here to the right is a flow chart that shows you that the distinction needs to be around is the condition congenital, is it acquired? And then we also need to work out if it's unilateral or bilateral, if it's acquired or unilateral or bilateral, if it's congenital. Also, if it's acquired, we need to work out if it's recent or long-standing. This video will specifically focus on acquired cranial nerve palsies that are recent and unilateral. In a subsequent video, we'll explore congenital uh, fourth nerve palsies as well as long-standing fourth nerve palsies. At this point, we'll also explore bilateral uh, cranial nerve palsies. But let's start off with what do we expect in a recent onset unilateral fourth nerve palsy. Okay, so when we're talking about the characteristics of the fourth nerve palsy, what we're focusing on is what are our expectations of the clinical findings when we assess a patient with a sarcovertical muscle palsy and specifically here a fourth nerve palsy. We'll go through um, these areas of what we expect on cover test, his chart, torsion, etc. in a patient with a fourth nerve. Let's start off with the cover test. You're aware now that from the modules that you've done on clinical investigations of a patient with incompetent strabismus, that the deviation will be opposite to the action of the extraocular muscle that's been palsy. So the primary deviation we're expecting will be vertical, we'll have a hypertropia, there may be an esotropia, and in terms of torsion, we'll have an excyclotropia. Now, the vertical deviation will increase towards the unaffected lateral side. So what we should see is if we have a right superior oblique palsy, when you move the patient into left gaze, you will see an increase in height. So this relates back to Park's three steps. So when you take the patient with a right superior oblique palsy, you move them into left gaze, you're moving the eyes into adduction, which is the position in which the um, superior oblique or the right superior oblique has uh, its field of action. So in this position, in adduction, you'll start to see um, an increase in the height, or you will see an increase in the height in that position. You may also find that there is an increase in the vertical deviation at near, and with the excyclotropia, remember that the excyclotropia will not occur in the position where the primary action of the deviation occurs, or the greatest excyclotropia, I should say. The greatest excyclotropia will occur where the secondary action takes place. So again, this will take place in abduction. And so for the right superior oblique, it will occur in right gaze and specifically in dextrodepression. We'll see the greatest amount of excyclotropia. So let's have a look at a patient here in nine positions of gaze who has a right superior oblique palsy. And what we see is the hypertropia in prior position, the right hypertropia. And we see that there is a vertical deviation here in um, left gaze. And upon measurements, it's noted that this is an increase in the height from prior position. And we're expecting that the increase will occur here because it is in this position of gaze that the superior oblique is taking um, effect and also the muscles sequelae. So the ipsilateral uh, antagonists, the contralateral synergists and the contralateral antagonists are all uh, acting in left gaze. So this is where you'll see the increase in the height um, given that the muscle sequelae is occurring in this position of gaze. So in terms of Park's three steps, we're going to see that hypertropia in primary will see an increase in one of the positions of lateral gaze. In terms of the right superior oblique, we'll see it in left gaze. And then as expected on um, Bill Chowski head tilt test, we expect to see that the 
height will increase when the patient tilts to the affected side. So in this instance, we can see that there is an increase in height in on right tilt as compared to left tilt. And this is indicating that on right tilt, the right eye is in cycloducting. And this is why we're getting an increase in height because as that right eye in cycloducts, the superior rectus remains unopposed, in which instance what will happen is that um, we'll see an increase in height as the superior oblique of the right eye is palsy. Okay, and here we just have a clearer um, or larger image of the increase in height on the right side. Okay, in terms of the HES chart, uh, we want to look for the muscle sequelae, dependent on how recently acquired the neurogenic palsy is, we may or may not see all components of the muscle sequelae. But here I'm giving you an image where we can see uh, all components of the muscle sequelae. Here we have a superior oblique underaction in the outer field. We can also see it in the inner field. We have an overaction of the inferior oblique, the ipsilateral antagonist, also seen in the outer field. And then if we move over to the contralateral synergist of the superior oblique, we see an overaction of the inferior rectus. And we also see a secondary inhibition of the superior rectus, seen both in the outer and the inner field. With the abnormal head posture, the patient will be attempting to move their eyes into a position where they have BSV. Theoretically, this will be in the position directly opposite to the field of action of the pausing muscle. So the right superior oblique works in dextro, sorry, lavo depression. And so we'll want to have our eyes in uh, dextro elevation to be in the directly opposite position to the field of action. And this will mean a face turned towards the unaffected side, chin down and tilt to the lower eye. Although tilt to the lower eye isn't so much to get into the position of, um, into a position of gaze. So if we have a look at the young boy over to the right, we can see that he's adopted all three components of the head posture. He's um, turning to the um, left, he's got a chin down and he's tilting to the lower eye. For a right superior oblique, that will be tilting to the left. At times, patients may adopt all three components, but then we see beneath the young girl who, or the young lady there, who is tilting simply to the left. She also has a right superior oblique, but in this instance, she's not um, demonstrating all three components. Fourth nerve pauses often will have a head tilt, but again, you may not see all, all components of the abnormal head posture. So this shouldn't um, deter you from uh, making a diagnosis of a fourth if you don't see all three components of the abnormal head posture. I just want to bring your attention to instances where you may have a paradoxical head tilt. What this means is that the patient may actually tilt to the higher eye rather than to the lower eye. This occasionally happens with um, fourth nerve palsy. It's not common, uh, but it can happen. And generally, it happens in patients who have an intermittent or unstable fusion. And what they're doing is that they're struggling to maintain BSV and therefore at times will tilt to the higher eye where the deviation is worse so that the images are separated further and that way their discomfort of trying to control the deviation is lost. Uh, and they don't have to continually try to make an effort to fuse as the images are further apart. The further apart the images are, it's also easier for people to cope with diplopia. Diplopia becomes quite bothersome when the images are close um, together and particularly if they're overlapping. So indeed, the smaller the deviation is, the more difficult it is for patient, patients to cope with um, with a diplopia and sometimes yeah, tilting to achieve greater separation of images and greater visual comfort may occur. Okay, in terms of torsion, given that we have an excyclotropia, you now know that patients with a fourth nerve palsy will report in torsion. You will find excyclotropia on testing them on any measures such as uh, double maddox rods and optophore, etc. 
Okay, for diplopia, here we've got a right superior oblique diplopia chart depicted. And as you now know, the greatest separation of the vertical deviation will usually be here in um, LAVO depression for a right superior oblique. But the torsion, uh, so the intorsion that the patient's experience will be greatest in dextro depression. If there is a horizontal deviation, often this will be an ET, it doesn't necessarily need to be, but this will mean uncrossed diplopia. If an XT is present, then obviously the patient will have crossed diplopia. Uh, in terms of uh, the horizontal component of the deviation, because that's the secondary action of the extraocular muscle, generally will be greatest in A reduction. So for the right superior oblique palsy, that will be in right gaze. Okay, area of BSV, as you know, um, again, it will be, as with the abnormal head posture, we'll be getting our eyes into the, uh, into the position directly opposite to the field of action of the extraocular muscle. So here again, we have a depicted right superior oblique um, area of BSV, and what we're finding is that it is in dextro elevation up here because the field of action of the right superior oblique is labo depression. So in summary here, I have provided you with a table of a comparison between the right superior oblique palsy and the left superior oblique palsy, and what to expect for each of the clinical investigations from deviation in prime position to lateral gaze or on tilt to the muscle sequelae and also the diplopia and the abnormal head posture. So these are some of the key findings that you'll, you'll have for patients who have a recently acquired neurogenic palsy that's unilateral, either a right superior oblique palsy or a left superior oblique palsy. Now given that the first inquiry was based on gaining an understanding of the principles of incompetent strabismus and an understanding of what to expect from the clinical outcomes of various investigations, the results here or what's presented here in, in the summary table should be relatively easy for you to work through as you base these findings on what we've discussed in terms of uh, diplopia charts, abnormal head postures and so forth in the previous uh, videos. Okay, that brings us to the conclusion of this video. Thank you for watching.